Welcome to another edition of WealthQuest. This is the show that brings clarity to the blurry world of portfolio management. I'm Samantha Loring. Now, this is a part two of a two-part series focused on the Winter 2013 Collective Insight Series, putting the spotlight on investment fees. Now, ask any investors what they deem to be important, and they'll probably highlight the creation of portfolio returns after fees. But is this really the right question to be asking? Fund management is uh, more complicated than this and certainly requires us to delve into investor holding periods, asset allocation, and uh, maybe most important, what skill does a manager require to just justify a fee? We'll be looking at some of these issues with Anne Cabot Alitaza, who heads up the Alexander Forbes Research Institute. And of course, we've got our two strategists, Kobe Lacrangi, strategist at Clucas Gray Investment Managers, and Roland Rousseau, equity strategist at APSA Capital. And it's good to have you back on the WealthQuest yes. desk. So we're talking about outperformance. Uh, is that uh, the reason that you'd be paying an active manager? What's the uh, industry thinking around outperformance uh, and the role that active managers play in delivering that? Well, I, I think that is the, the alpha and the omega of, mm -hmm. of what asset managers are trying to strive for. Uh, that's why they issue performance fees. They say, measure me on the basis of my outperformance. But I think if you've listened to Roland long enough, you'll hear him say many, many times that what you're paying for is not necessarily skill. It may be something that he's simply doing systematically that happened to pay off at that point in time. And the problem with a lot of these costs is that you end up on an on a incremental basis paying almost 92.7% is the fee that you're paying mm -hmm. for this, this privilege of this alpha. So do we then just jettison all active managers and say the heck with these guys, they're not really um, delivering anything of any value? and just go out there and get a low cost index fund. And I think that really is the crux of the debate because should fund managers be paid for outperformance or should they be paid for performance that's in line with an exp realistic expectation and should they not be paid for at least giving you a steady hand at the tiller and engender a level of trust in you to keep you invested because I think if if we can move the sh shift the discussion away from cost to something that you've mentioned several times, which is value destruction versus mm -hmm. cost, the real issue in value destruction is not sticking the course, not staying invested. It's chopping and changing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, and I mean that's that's a that's a critical component there for me. <coughs> is sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Um, we we make decisions based upon portfolios that we've invested in because maybe things are not aligned to exactly what we thought the outcome will be in the short term. And we make those decisions often and we chop and change often at the worst possible time that we possibly can. As a matter of fact, if you look at the screen right now, you'll see a study that was done by a gentleman called John Bogle, who actually is um, used to be the head of the Vanguard organization in the United States, which is a very large asset manager. And he does a study by, by asking the simple question, what is the average return that an American investor is left with after investing over 25 years? Well, if the market gave you 12.3% over that period, then the average mutual fund would have achieved about 10%. But look what the average experience of, is for the average investor. It's only about 7.3%. And that just shows you kind of the value destruction. These are people chopping and changing. It's in essence saying, well, I'm not happy with what's happening here. I think that I could be achieving returns that are in line with somebody else's returns. Mm -hmm. Let me now swap. And of course, Roland, the problem with that is the timing of when you do swap because you perhaps could be buying into a fund or a specific allocation uh, when it comes to certain sectors at the peak and what happens after that is certainly not good for your portfolio and your uh, money. I, I think the, the, the key reason for this difference is that people chase return. And in other words, if a fund manager has a higher return than another fund manager, we, see, we seem to follow that fund manager, but we don't understand. And um, the definition of skill is not did you beat the benchmark or did you beat your peers? The real definition of skill is did you beat the risks you've taken? Yes. And the problem we have with this is that by chasing <coughs> return, we're chasing the riskier fund managers because mm -hmm. the way you get return is by taking on more risk. <coughs> so the best fund managers are not at the top of the ranking or at the bottom of the ranking. They're somewhere in between because those are the guys that might have actually delivered consistent skill rather than a sort of shot in the dark. And I think what uh, investors tend to do is focus only on the return and mm -hmm. that creates this value destruction. Maybe this mm -hmm. is a question that I'd like to ask maybe both of you. Let's assume the active managers worldwide charged a fairer fee over time for their services. 
Let's assume that was the case. Do you believe that the passive industry would still have happened? And first. Huh, oh, there we go. Well, let's, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put Roland on the no, as, as no, the as the passive guy on the on the on the on the on the no, on the spot in the spot here first. So if the if the fees weren't if there wasn't a fee differential, would there be a passive industry? Yeah. If they were fairer, or and whatever fairer, fairer, fairer means, say. or lower uh, over time. There are two types of passive investing. There's a buy and hold strategy, which is you buy something and you don't change it. That is actually the most inefficient way of, of investing because markets change. Mm -hmm. So you're not adding anything new to the portfolio. But if you track an index, it's actually not technically passive because the index is constantly changing. And if you choose the top 40 or the Osha index or whatever to track, you're making an active decision that you want large cap stocks with a high concentration in there. So um, I'd like to discuss what the definition of passive is, but uh, I think, <laughs> I think uh, the fee differential has been the biggest reason why people are investing sure, in, in sure. passive I industry. think as well, um, are you trying to simply replicate what the wisdom of uh, you know, several million people are in terms of what the value of something is? Or are you trying to operate in a market to identify things that have a very different value? That, and passive, of course, is chasing the herd. You are the herd. And active is, of course, trying to take a contrarian view and to try to identify opportunities that are out there. So I think <coughs> the fee differential would have, I mean, not the fee differential, the, dif the, the two different strategies would have existed anyway because people would not have wanted to necessarily what one about, or the other. You know, does this not bring us to, the, to another point that you're making around uh, a liability manager and the role that they play in terms of your money over time because it's not just around you know stock picking and around you know betting on certain certain equities it's also around uh, the overall asset allocation uh, I mean, talk, to, talk to us around that well I think um, <coughs> let, let's get to the role of the financial planner and we'll put that in the fee context too if you're going to a financial planner <coughs> expecting that his primary job is to run and chase performance on your behalf by identifying who's going to be the top performing fund manager. That is absolutely the recipe for disaster. But if you go to that liability manager, that financial advisor that says, here's where I want to go. This is what I need to be able to generate you know, by that. Here's the time frame I have to work with. Mm -hmm. Then they can design the solution. And by designing the solution, they're designing it out of the asset classes and asset strategies that have the highest probability of getting you to that target within the time frame that you've given them. You can do that passively, you can do that with ac active elements, it doesn't matter. But that point of, of departure. departure is the critical point of departure. Yep. And therefore, you need to understand when you go to a financial advisor what you're paying them for. And it's not to generate high returns. It's mm -hmm. to generate a targeted outcome that you've chosen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, and we're coming back now again to the, the point that we made right in the beginning is regardless of the strategy that you follow, are you philosophically aligned to that strategy? And do you think that you're actually paying a fair fee for that at the end of the day? And, um, and, and I must say that the paper that you wrote for Collective Inside, uh, you know, I had to go and print out, print out Richard Ennis' uh, paper, Are Active Management Fees Too High Again? And go and yeah. reread it. And, uh, and, and as I've mentioned to you, it absolutely, you know, kind of, again, just kind of showed the importance of, of this paper. Let's maybe show you some of the outcomes of that paper, and then we can discuss those a little bit more with Anne uh, today. Literally, Richard Ennis says there's two continuums in order to understand fees. The one is what we call probability of investor success. And there you can see investor success on this side of the axis. Investor success definition is basically returns after fees have been paid to the manager. And then on the second axis, or the x-axis, is the probability of manager skill. And manager skill is after trading costs being able to achieve a positive return beyond a benchmark. Now let's assume you pay the active, the, or the, the asset manager absolutely no fee. Well, then quite frankly, you'd be sitting somewhere on this continuum. If the manager is right 60% of the time, 60% of the benefit will follow through to you. But once you start paying fees, and let's now just take, for instance, a 1.5% uh, uh, level of fee that you pay, let's see how successful the manager needs to be in order for you to have a reasonable probability of investor success. Well, here you can see it. If you were right as a manager about 80% of the time, you're probably sitting in a situation whereby, um, whereby you're going to be giving 50, the... 50-50. Yeah, it's about a 50-50 chance that you're going to be giving 
for success as far as the investor is concerned. But that means the manager has to be right about 80% of the time by paying a 1.5% and, and fee. And how likely is that? Yeah, absolutely. And what we did is we did the, an exercise looking at the large manager watch, and we said, okay, how right do you have to be to be top quartile? And the answer is somewhere around 62%. Yeah. So a top quartile manager is right about 62% of the time. In that a South means, African context? I yes. Mean, how in a often South does that happen? So, no, that's top quartile. Mm -hmm. Okay, someone who's ri right 80% of the time is off the Richter scale. You know, <laughs> that, that's that's what I'm trying we're to get. We're still give us looking for that manager. <laughs> we're still trying to find that manager. So you know, you're so you're the best managers in South Africa, right? 60% of the time. But it's not South Africa. Those are global, global. numbers. Those are fairly glo standard global numbers. Mm -hmm. That um, <coughs> and, and and I think all this chart is trying to do is that it's asking you to be realistic. It's being asking you to be realistic about two things how much value a fund manager can add after fees, how much skill they would require to do that, and how likely is that, and really what is the damage of fees. And it's, you know, what I should have done here is thrown in some of the recent work Bill Sharp's done, where he's, he's looked at the whole question of the difference between uh, a lump sum investment that you're paying an ongoing fee on and regular contributions that you're also paying a, a fee on. And what it really gets down to is that when you're looking at the impact of costs, what Sharp talks about is something called the total wealth ratio. It says, look at the full lifetime experience of the investor in that vehicle and what kind of destruction of value takes place because of the fees and because of the kind of contributions that you're making. And that gives you the correct picture, not that passive is at 20 basis points and active is at 120 basis points. That's not the difference. So what's the difference then between the uh, contributions on, on you know, a more regular basis and that lump sum? Well, in, well okay, there's, there's not like an instant answer, but mm -hmm. uh, what, what Sharp allows you to do is that it says that the more aggressive your fund is, the higher the tracking error of the fund, the higher the probability of outcomes that you could possibly have from there. And therefore, that has a real impact on your potential total wealth experience when you get to the end of that, that experience. In other and, words, and I, mean, and I suppose here in South Africa, we've actually been very, very lucky because even though that wide tracking area of different outcomes exists, we've been really, really lucky over the last 20 years where the market has actually done phenomenally well in South Africa, yeah. which has not necessarily been a US experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's just, I just want to quickly show you the graphic again that, uh, that, that Anne spoke about just now. Just, uh, there you can see, I just want to again show you, if, if a manager is right about 60% of the time and you're paying that ma manager a half a percent fee per annum, quite frankly, you're standing a chance of about 50% manager of, of being right as an investor or getting what we call investor success. If you're paying what's, what is called a 3% fee, quite frankly, you stand a minuscule chance of actually getting investor success. And and we've got to end it off there. Okay, Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Anne.